Do you like books? I mean, really, really like books? Then you're in the right place. Each week, your host, Sam Hankin, interviews the best of today's top selling authors and the up and coming superstars of modern literature. This is The Avid Reader. Here is your host, Sam Hankin. Hello, everybody, and welcome to another edition of The Avid Reader brought to you by Wellington Square Bookshop. Our guest today is David Atchison, author of The Spirit of Mathematics, Algebra, and all of that. It was published by the Oxford University Press. It was released earlier this year. David was appointed a fellow in mathematics at Jesus College, Oxford, in 1977 and became an emeritus fellow in 2008. Now, this I don't mean this to scare you away, but in 1976, um, he discovered the first examples, the examples of wave over reflection uh, in a stable system. Later, his research focused on magnetic fields and differential rotation in stars with new results on magnetic buoyancy, the Taylor instability, the Goldreich Schubert instability, and magneto rotational instability. We are not going to talk about any of that today. <laughs> today we're going <laughs> Today, we're going to talk about, well, first of all, his prior books, 1089, 1089, and all that. It's important. Uh, then the Calculus Story, which was a mathematical adventure, the Wonder Book of Geometry. And you, you notice these words, these amplification words, go to the passion of his involvement in mathematics. Yeah, the Wonder Book of Geometry, a mathematical story. And this one, the spirit, and I like the idea of the spirit of mathematics algebra and all of that. And it's the elements in these books that we'll be talking about today, especially, of course, as it relates to the spirit of mathematics, and that includes my least favorite middle school course of study, algebra. I really like the fact that the main title of this book, as I said, is the spirit, because for a good portion of my life, I have been semi obsessive with the concept of solving for X, because isn't that the purpose of our entire life every day to solve for X? Now, be that as it may, there's so many problems in algebra that are fun, sometimes paradoxical and often enlightening, that when phrased as word problems, I can actually sometimes comprehend. In this book, David gives us these examples and follows them up with the formulas that lead to their understanding, whether it be the quadrat quadratic equation and why he feels it's exciting, and I don't, <laughs> or the idea of 90 degrees being a constant when investigating the nature of a circle and and a segment of same, whatever that might be, or even more fun, the Indian rope trick or the upside down pendulum. Best said, my understanding of algebra has been quantified, no pun, by this book, along with a little help from my daughter, um, whose uh, AP Physics Excellence Award uh, helped me in understanding this. So if you're taken aback a bit by Mersenne numbers or infinite primes, first posited by Euclid, and parenthetically, the illustrations and explanations of beginnings um, by exploring the math mathematicians whose shoulders we stand on are a big help in getting to know this book as a course of study. And I should mention his, uh, David's YouTube videos are, videos are very instructive, uh, very clear, and uh, almost soothing, much like his guitar playing. So uh, welcome, David. Thanks so much for joining us today. Well, thank you very much for inviting me. It's a pleasure to be here. Well, so, as I said in the introduction, and maybe this is the wrong question, but this is the way I actually do look at it. Why ought we, and why is it required in algebra to solve for x? Oh, well, funnily enough, um, I might disagree with you on this, in the sense that I think the main purpose of algebra is generality, actually, so that the most important aspect of X is that X could be any number. You're sh showing that something is true for all X. I would say that's even more important than the many times, I agree, in which X is some specific number that you're trying to find. Um, and that, so in a sense, I would say that formulae in which things like X occur, they are more important than actually finding X. Um, but so I, that's, I would say algebra above all else is a, is, is, a, is a means for generality in mathematics. Mathematicians are obsessed with 
making general statements that are true for infinite number of different values. And algebra is the key to doing that. Um, but uh, I, I, I sort of <laughs> I sort of regret disagreeing with you so so early on. I have to admit that the history of algebra is absolutely full of people trying to solve Rex. You know, that's how the subject developed. But the, but the reason it developed, I think, is, is, is generality rather than finding one specific number given various clues. Oh, I don't look at it as a reprimand. I, I, I look at it as being helpful in me understanding. And the funniest thing at the very beginning of the book was when I was talking to my daughter, as I said, um, she said to me before she even knew it, you said it, she goes, isn't C boring? And uh, I said, well, I think that, that uh, Dr. Atchison said that C was boring, but then he said, actually, it's kind of exciting. But she goes, but it's just a constant and it's efficient, but it doesn't really do anything. So when we do our experiments, or not experiments, but when I was a kid, and just like in your examples, a, B, and C are rowing down the river, or they run on the river together, or we're filling a bathtub. Um, it, I kind of understood it, but I didn't. But if you talk about what C was, why some people consider it boring, but the humorist thought it, it yeah, the humorist thought it was boring, but you think it's not necessarily. And that was a convoluted way of saying it. That might be really helpful. I, I don't, I'm not quite. I, I got um, I got confused there between whether C in mathematics often denotes a constant, but C of A, B, and C is a fictitious person. Uh, at least that's the way I've always thought of it. Uh, you, are you referred to you referred to A, B, and C rowing? And actually, you take me aback because you you, you interpret A, B, and C. I think. Um, as mathematical symbols in that context. And I've never thought of it that way. I think of C as a rather small person, uh, as illustrated in the cartoon, in fact, which I could show you if you, if you, if you like. I've got, I've got the book to hand. Yeah, sure. Uh, um, I've got, I can show you A, oh, B, wait, and C. Before you do that, show, me the, show the cover up so that my readers and listeners, when they come in I'm the book, you can just center there, right there in front of your is. head. Yeah, just move. There you go. And it's it, it's a guy it's a kid at a desk with papers ruffling around him, and it gives me the idea of how I felt when I first uh, encountered algebra. But go ahead well, and show. Well, it, that is that, that is meant to be in a sense to be me, aged about twelve, having a a, a mathematical epiphany. You know, um, uh, this was a little bit after the ten eighty nine trick. But um, oh well, well, let's just um, go right there. Let's talk about what what you we were talking about before the show started, and how one how you had that moment of epiphany when you realized, hey, it's 1089, but I don't know why it's 1089 and how it could be 1089 and what the 1089 trick is. Should, should we, in fact, do you think, do that for your viewers now? Or should I, should oh, yeah. I, do, the, should I do the trick to you? Because yeah. I've, I've got, cause I've got uh, a pencil here and some paper. Um, I'll invite you to give me a three-figure number. You just need to make sure that the uh, first figure is greater than the last figure by more than one. Okay. Otherwise, otherwise any three-figure number. I've done this about 20 times since I read your book. <laughs> <laughs> All right, 752. 752. So I take your number, 752, reverse it, and subtract one from the other. Um, slow there. 495. And then we reverse that and add. So you reverse and subtract, reverse the result and add 1089 every time, no matter which number. One starts with. Well, as I, as I say, I just couldn't figure out age ten seeing that in a 
I've got it here actually. The, this, this is not the original, but it's, I saw it in a children's book called The Eye Spy Annual, where it was presented as a magic trick in a section called Abracadabra. Yeah, I think that um, it may have been Arthur C. Clarke who said something about anything that's sufficiently difficult to understand is magic uh, <laughs> until it's understood. And I think that's the way you felt initially. Then how did you become the person who could reduce it from mathematics, from magic into mathematics? What um, was it triggered that? That I that I forget, to be honest. I forget when it wasn't. I, I forgot having had that an exciting moment when I was 10, I forgot all about it for many years. So I probably only sorted it out. Uh, by, the, by the time I sorted it out, using a bit of algebra, I was probably a, um, uh, a mathematician at Jesus College. You know, it was uh, years later that I sorted it out. Really? Yes, yes. It didn't, it didn't, it didn't haunt me all those years or anything. I, I, uh, I just let it, when I was 10, I just let it go. I, I, I didn't understand why it worked. My, puzzled me for a few hours, but I let it go. Well, maybe it's an impossible question to answer without paper and pencil, but is there a way that you could relatively concisely explain why the phenomenon is that? I can try. Um, yes, I can. Yes. Um, if you the, the the trick is to label the three figures a b and c so your a was seven b was five c was two you label them a b c as the actual figures the number you start with will then be a hundred times a plus ten times b plus c so you write that down you reverse it and subtract and what you find is you get a multiple of 99 that 495 that i got was a multiple of 99 you always get a multiple of 99 so if you write down the three figure multiples of 99 198 297 and so forth you soon see why if you reverse any one of those you always get the same answer so the, the key the key is to realize that halfway through you've got a multiple of 99. Well, that leads me to thinking about, and I'm trying to go chronologically with regard to the book, but that leads me to the magic square because in America, so many people are obsessed with the Sudoku um, and it's much more complicated than the magic square. But if you think of a three by three box and a middle number and then lying equivalent numbers up left and right up and down can you can you do the same thing you just did with 1089 and explain the rules behind that decision making process no that's 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 very different and i all i would be inclined to say about the magic square which um i have in my book, as you, as you know, is I use it slightly unusually as a vehicle for illustrating something called proof by contradiction, um, which, which is a really important method in, in mathematics. And it's basically where you are, you're trying to prove some statement is true. And you prove it by your, your first line is assume it isn't true, assume it's false. And then you deduce from that various things, looking to get a contradiction, looking to get something like, you never know what this contradiction is going to be, but something like one equals two or something. That, that means that your initial assumption that the proposition was false must be wrong. Therefore, the proposition is true. It's a, it's a, some people find it an irritating argument. I've always found it a lovely argument. And that's what I use the um, um, magic square form in the book. A little unusual. It's not what most people do with a magic square. I, I use a magic square for a uh, slightly unusual purpose. Yeah, but it's, I think all my questions are going to be wrong, but I don't mind. <laughs> I think being wrong is the best way to end I'm, up being right. 
I'm not sure your question. I'm not sure your question was wrong. I just uh, wanted to explain why I used magic square, and, and that's about all I know about magic squares. How the idea of proof con by contradiction can be used to help you make one. Yeah, and there's a, a lot of things about counterintuitiveness, improbability, and then infinite, infinite things. But one of the thing, one of the illustrations is of Sherlock Holmes and his Mersham pipe, and his saying that when you eliminate everything that's impossible, whatever remains has to be the truth, which gives rise to all the conspiracy theories I have in my head. But it sounds like why does that maxim and algebra correlate? How does it correlate? Especially with regard to your initial statement about generality. I, I, well, I, well, I do actually say in the cartoon is is that is that Sherlock Holmes quote, proof by contradiction, or just a bit like it. I do because I get myself off the hook. But I do, I do think it's I do think the two things uh, are uh, similar. Uh, if you are trying to prove something and you assume it's false, and that leads you to a contradiction, uh, you are excluding the idea that it's false. Uh, and what's left is the idea that it's true. You know, I, I, I do think they are very similar things. I'm not, I'm not claiming that Conan Doyle was aware of proof by contradiction. Um, I imagine, I don't, I really don't know this, but I imagine he he got that quote from. I mean, he was a medic, wasn't he? I think, and I think that I mean, isn't that? I was told once by a doctor that that's largely what they do in diagnosing illnesses they they tend to work by excluding things it's not this it's not that it's not that therefore it must be this you know and i think that's i imagine that's where conan doyle got that quote from his experience as a medic yeah I don't know. I, when i practiced law and did a lot of medical um reading which i immediately forgot thereafter but lasted long enough to do the case a differential diagnosis is exactly that is eliminating everything and then whatever remains and that's the part of mathematics where you talk about the spirit and i almost look at it as metaphysical is that no matter what the result is and how improbable it seems it's correct Yes, given whatever assumptions were made at the beginning, I mean, there's always <laughs> there's always that, particularly when it comes to applied mathematics and mathematical modeling and so forth. Uh, um, you, know, uh, you know, mathematics is uh, only as true as, as it's as the assumptions that go into it. You, you make you make assumptions and you deduce things from that, um, get get conclusions after often very very many steps. Uh, but whatever you end up with is only going to be as true as the assumptions were in the first place. Yes. But you have to be intelligent enough to make sure that you eliminate all the assumptions that are wrong. So you have to, at the outset, come up with a system in which you know that you're testing all the assum assumptions, but the one that turns out to be the correct one. I don't understand that either. Sorry. I, I no, I I don't feel it's like that. As I say, in, in mathematics, you make you make certain assumptions at the beginning. Um, I for whatever for whatever reason, for a for a practical reason, or for just um, because you're playing around, you make certain assumptions, and then you try to deduce things. And then in, in, in applied mathematics, I, I, I was, uh, as you mentioned, I was uh, used to research in fluid mechanics for many years before I got into maths popularization. Uh, and there, you, your assumption, you make certain assumptions like um, a fluid has got zero viscosity or very small viscosity or it's very viscous or something. And, and you use those assumptions to deduce certain things about them, always on the lookout to either, ex to either explain some phenomenon that you've observed already, or to make a prediction about what might happen in the future 
in some experiment or other. But whatever you, whatever your end result is, whatever your predictions are, you've always got to remember the assumptions you made at the beginning. Uh, and if, for example, this is a big, big problem in the subject in, in the 19th century. If, for example, you are dealing with some fluid, like perhaps water or air, and you assume for simplicity that they're not viscous at all. You put the coefficient of viscosity equal to zero because unlike something like honey, uh, water doesn't seem very viscous at all. Uh, you get in that subject, you get some extraordinary problems. You find that that assumption works great uh, in many things like wave motion and so forth, and it works appallingly badly in th things like flow past a um, airplane wing or flow past a circular cylinder even. Uh, and for decades, fluid dynamicists were absolutely puzzled by how the assumption made at the beginning worked fine in some cases and not in others. They couldn't figure out why this was the case. And so you're, 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 you, what happens as the result of your mathematical deductions uh, depends on the assumptions you make in the first place. Uh, it's uh, interesting. Yesterday, I read an article about how to escape from quicksand. It says you can't drown in quicksand because you're not going to, your head's not going to go under. It said, one, do not panic, because if you panic and flail your legs, the sand will become more viscous. It says what you should do, what you ought to do is move your legs slowly back and forth to create a gap between the, the sand and your legs. And at the same, and then when that occurs, lean forward so your entire body is touching the sand so you create greater surface area so that less pressure is placed upon your legs and then just gradually continue to move your legs slowly. How would you go about explaining that algebraically? Oh, <laughs> don't, uh, I, was, I can't believe it. <laughs> uh, I, uh, oh, I, um, was it, um, am I right? Is, was the article right? I, I've no idea. I absolutely no idea because, um, <laughs> firstly, I haven't been doing research for at least 10 or 15 years. Secondly, um, the fluid I was thinking of, um, very, um, uh, without mentioning it, was what's called a Newtonian fluid. Um, that doesn't help us very much, but I, I'm talking about sort of everyday fluids that behave. Well, you did say, it, but you did say honey. That's what made me think of it. Ah, uh, 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 no. Well, I, I uh, no honey. Honey to me is just a uh, visc very viscous Newtonian fluid. Quicksand is something else altogether, and it's not something I've ever. Um, I've I've never been to a lecture on quicksand dynamics or whatever. You know, I've never read about it. Um, I'm afraid I would completely clueless. And uh, it, it, I agree that it's, it sounds very uh, kind of everybody knows. Don't panic if it happens to you. If, if try and keep calm and move slowly. I think that I think, I think people know that, but why that's good advice, I, I don't know. Um, I'm uh, sorry, I'm a bit, I'm a bit, <laughs> I'm a bit speechless. You completely caught me on the hop, and I, I, I don't, I, I'm not, and especially when you ask me to explain it algebraically. I mean, yeah, I, you know, I, I don't think you, dare I say, I don't, I'm not quite sure you appreciate just how tricky the subject of fluid dynamics is. It's a fiendish subject. Well, and it's, bad enough, that, but, it's bad enough with Newtonian fluids, let alone quicksand. Um, well, so I asked, <laughs> so my daughter says that she approached physics from an algebraic basis. And then when I looked online, I said, both an algebraic basis for physics is acceptable, but also basing your further study of physics through the through calculus is just as valid. That was another thing I didn't understand. I'm just asking you stuff I don't understand. No, Sorry. but that's that that's uh, that <laughs> I'm a bit better on algebraic calculus than I am on quicksand. I can tell you that. Um, the, <laughs> the, 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 um, 
I still find that conversation about algebra and calculus a bit peculiar. Uh, uh, you, need, you need to know some algebra to do calculus. What calculus is really all about uh, is, is about the rate at which things change. We all know that change is all around us, especially if you're doing science and engineering, everything, everything is changing. Uh, of, of some, of, usually I'm talking about change with time, but you can also have a change with distance, you know, a wave, a water wave, its height is going to depend on the distance as well as the time. And changes everywhere. The rate at which things are changing turns out to be absolutely fundamental for reasons I'm not sure anybody really understands. Uh, the rate at which things change. Uh, and that's the reason you need mathematics for physics. Above all else, I would say, it's just so much in physics uh, is about um, rates at which things change. It's as simple as that. So I would say calculus is much more fundamental for most sciences than algebra itself. Algebra is needed. Now, calculus is cast in the language of algebra. It's the ideas of calculus that uh, that's when, to be honest, if you're doing, if most people do maths or science or engineering or whatever, uh, when they meet the calculus, that's an absolute watershed moment. That's when things really start taking off, in, in my view. That's what my daughter said. But again, as a bookseller, um, this interview, in addition to elucidating an education, educating is also designed to help sell your book. So I should, oh. rather than wander off as I tend to do, I should go to some of the aspects of the book that are very entertaining and accessible to people because I wanna make sure people understand that notwithstanding the fact that there are a lot of formulas in your book, even if you didn't study the formulas, you would learn a great deal. So why don't we use an example of say, you pick it, either the Indian rope trick, or in your YouTube video, you actually show um, the moment in which the inverted pendulum becomes an inverted pendulum. So take one of those and see if you can. Again, we're doing it without pictorial uh, assistance, but say, let's just talk about the Indian rope trick because most of us know what that is in the real world as far as pen and teller or magic, stuff like that. That, that was... Uh... I, 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 I learned of that around the age of the 1089 trick. I was interested in magic when I was uh, young. Uh, I used to su subscribe to a magic catalog in which uh, you, could, you, could, you could buy virtually anything for money, which of course I didn't have uh, aged 10. Uh, you know, you could, you could buy, you could make sort of canaries appear out of nowhere, things like this, if you've got, if you've got, if you've got sort of nine pounds Ten shillings, and you know, but but my pocket money was only about sort of two and sixpence or something. So that was just. Um, I learned about the Indian rope trick, and that was one thing that wasn't in the catalog. You couldn't get even approximation to the Indian rope trick. When you throw a length of the rope into the air, it stays up there, defying gravity. And then in the trick itself, which I emphasise, I can't do. Uh, you send a little boy, or I suppose girl, up the rope and they disappear at the top you know that's that's and then that's the end of the end of the trick and uh, the uh, whole books have been written about the extent to which this has ever been done or not um the extent to which it's this whole thing can be a hoax or whatever uh and what happened was that i think it was about I forget just when it was it was, it was 19 1990 so i was about 44 or something. Um, I started studying the nearest thing I got to it, which involved pendulums, not rope. Uh, I'd often wondered if you have a rigid pendulum, just a rod with a little mass at the bottom, so normally swinging to and fro, uh, if you turn it upside down, it's obviously un unstable. There's, a, there's an equilibrium position exactly vertically upwards, but the slightest disturbance, it will obviously collapse. Uh, and it, it had been known for a long, long time, you can stabilize it by vibrating the pivot up and down at, a, at the bottom at a, at a very high frequency. And I'd always wondered whether it, 
you could do that with more than one pendulum. If you have one hanging from another, and then another hanging from that, so you've got three pendulums hanging from each other downwards, and you put the whole lot upside down, might the same trick work? And I assumed the answer was no, that the lower pendulum would be too wobbly a support for any more. But I was spectacularly wrong. It was a, it was a lovely example, in my view, uh, of mathematics getting where my physical intuition, anyway, couldn't reach. Uh, and within a week or two, uh, in three quarters of an hour it took me, um, I finally sat down trying to prove a general theorem for any number of pendulums you like. Um, I thought, to be honest, I was just flying a kite. I, I didn't think it could possibly come out, this theorem. I thought I'd just get stuck. And three quarters of an hour later, you know, it was, it was an exciting moment. I, I, I just, I knew instantly my mathematical life was going to change. Um, the result came out saying that you can do it with any finite number of pendulums you like, if you vibrate the bottom pivot by a small enough amount at a high enough frequency, you can always do it. Um, and that's what got me onto national television a couple of years later uh, and um, put me, uh, launched me into popular maths, which is what I've been doing ever since. So that's, yeah. that's, my, that's my take on the Indian road trick. There's no, there's no trick about it. It's actually, it's actually a strange physical phenomenon which mathematics alone really uncovered. The interesting thing when you watch your YouTube video about it, when you actually have the mechanism in place is you, you have this motor that is able to generate these frequencies and you're turning a knob and holding the mechanism and then you gradually let go of the mechanism, turn the knob a little further and then you have first a wobbling and then a relatively stable pendulum. So the question for someone who hasn't read the book yet, and again, I'm gonna ask the same thing, hopefully I, I'm right this time, is how algebraically does that tie into the result that you're able to explain? And then your Wikipedia entry, it says you've solved the Indian rope trick. <laughs> it says that. I, don't, I don't know who put that up, but it's, uh, uh, I forget what it says, but if, if, it, if it says I solved the Indian rope trick, it's just pure nonsense. I mean, uh, but I should say, excuse me, I'm just gonna have a little sip of water. Um, I should say that uh, algebra alone doesn't explain it. It's, it's differential equations, it's, it's, it's advanced calculus again. That three quarters of an hour was spent doing calculus um, that, that, that did it. And I also want to say, um, we shouldn't overlook this, this particular topic isn't in the book. It isn't in the spirit of mathematics. It's actually, it's actually covered in an earlier book of mine, which you kindly mentioned, called 1089 and all that. So I, sh I shouldn't, um, yeah, uh, should, I shouldn't be at false pretenses here. The, the Indian rope trick isn't in the algebra book. No. Well, then um, take one that is, and we can move from a specific experiment because everyone knows what this is to something else. But let's talk about the spinning top then. The spinning top is there to illustrate uh, the importance of, from my personal point of view, it's slightly personal, it's to illustrate the point of quadratic equations, which, unless I'm mistaken, you had a go at earlier. Um, but, um, quadratic equations, they, lots of people do ask, what on earth was the point of quadratic equations? When they sort of whine about their school days, a lot of people uh, take, uh, have a real thing about quadratic equations rather than anything else. There was even uh, in uh, England, there was even a debate in Parliament about them. Uh, some, I think it was 10 years ago or so, when somebody proposed that they should be banned from the school syllabus altogether. Somebody else uh, thought, I'm going, to, I'm going to take the, I'm going to, I'm going to write to my MP about this. And, they, and there was a whole debate about them in Parliament. It was good nature, it didn't really get anywhere, but it was. Um, uh, 
they do get singled out for. And, and, and it's a shame, just people haven't got a clue and they're not told at school, typically. Uh, arguably, there, there are two things about quadratic equations. Why, why solve quadratic equations? Well, one answer is, have you any idea how difficult it can be to solve any other type of equation? The fact that you can always solve it by a simple device called completing the square ought to be a matter of great celebration. So that's, that's one answer. But the other thing that's key is that quadratic equations, depending on the coefficients involved, may or may not have real solutions. Your x that you're looking for may or may not be a real number. A, sim a very simple example um, would be x squared plus one equals zero. If anyone who knows a little bit of algebra can see that that can have no real solution. If x is a real number, positive or negative, x squared will be positive. So x squared plus one can't be zero. It'll, it'll, it's inevitably going to be positive. Therefore, that equation, which is a quadratic equation, uh, can't have a real solution. Uh, and that's the point of the spinning. I do give the quadratic equation that governs its stability. And the, uh, when that quadratic equation has a real solution, the top is stable, spinning upside down. And when it uh, doesn't have a real solution, it's unstable. And that's how you get little criterion that says you have to spin it at such and such a speed or, it, or a fall on it. The funny thing when I was reading the book was when I got to you saying, Quadratic equations are so exciting. I actually closed the book. <laughs> well, well, I see. Well, I don't know what to say about that. Um, it's your, it's your right. You can do what you, you do what you like with a book. You know, uh, you know. Uh, and all, well, any, no, no. I, I, any, re, I reopened the book and finished it. It was just for the moment. I was thinking, okay, how can he say that? I'll just close the book and think about that for a while because it was the, one of the least exciting things that I had ever counted in my life. And you kind of validated it by what you just, the story, the humorous story you just told as well. It's, um, but it's, it's, it's true, it is true, it is true in general. You know, any author has to accept when, pe when people have paid their money, uh, it's not their book anymore. It's the person who bought it, you know, and they can do what they, uh, they can do what they like with it. And uh, I agree. Uh, you know, and I, you know, um, um, I, I don't want you to misunderstand me. I didn't look at it like, well, but you know, you're hundred percent right. And as a bookseller, that's the, my favorite part of reading a book is that the author maybe feels as if he's sent his firstborn son out into the world. But once he has done that, um, the reader has every right to do whatever the reader wants to do with it. And especially in fiction, uh, the books that end where you go, I wonder what's going to happen next. Those are the books that are the most valuable ones rather than, than the ones that are tied up neatly at the end and you're done. I'd much rather live a life in which I'm thinking about what could possibly happen next. And that's why I like the word spirit. But when you're talking about um, X plus one can't possibly be, that reminds me of when you talked about the square root of minus one. Yes. So let's correlate yeah. those. Well, the, the solution uh, of x squared plus one equals zero is x equals plus or minus the square root of minus one, and then uh, which is a so-called imaginary number, and uh, that again caused a lot of um, um, alarm uh, centuries ago. Uh, it was a long time before those numbers were taken uh, seriously, um, but but basically what happened was that somebody, an Italian, eventually decided to treat such numbers just like ordinary numbers that go through the motions, see what happened, uh, and everything is, is gradually became clear. Um, so it's not, it was, it was, I'm being slightly superficial now, but it was, a, it was another example of um, sometimes with a very, very difficult mathematical problem, just keep your head and keep going, you know, is, is good advice. And um, uh, 
don't give up too easily. Mathematics is not a subject for um, people who give up you give up things they're interested in easily. You you have to have a certain amount of you don't have to be brilliant, brilliantly intellectual or anything. You, you do need a certain amount of sticking power, sheer sticking power to do mathematics well. Which reminds me, anytime I interview a mathematician or a physicist or even somebody who's looking at the uh, neurological basis for human consciousness or self-awareness, I always ask this question, which is, why is one not a prime number? And because at one point, 100 years ago, it kind of was, because I always look at, at, from my weird point of view, it's divisible by one and by itself, which are two different things, because one is the name for it. So I asked this uh, Nobel Prize winning physicist, uh, Frank Wilczek, who discovered time crystals. I said, why is one not a prime number? And he goes, because it wouldn't be convenient. Yes, I think that's, uh, that's, that's I, I can, as I understand, I, it's, this isn't my field, but I can elaborate a bit if you like. Um, it Please. wouldn't be, it wouldn't, it, it wouldn't be convenient because it would then mean that it's, um, let me get this right. Um, if you take any number, the claim is that it can be um, expressed as the product of a number of primes uh, in one particular way only. So if you take 10, it can be expressed as two times five, both of which are prime. And it can't be expressed as a product of some other primes. You, you, can't, be, you can't get 10 by multiplying three by seven by 11, say. It can be expressed, any, any number can be expressed as a product of primes in one way only. Well, if you let one in, you just have a complete shambles because it means that uh, 10 can be written as two times five, or it can be written as one times two times five, or one times one times two times five. You know, that, it, that's, as, as I understand it, that's the complete answer. That's what Frank meant by convenience. Did you ever read um, um, Gerdel Escher Bach by Douglas? Douglas I'm afraid Hoffman. I haven't. No, it's it's on the. I, I no, I'm being, I've been narrow-minded about it. I've I've glanced at it, thought it wasn't my cup of tea. I've never looked at it seriously. No, and perhaps I should have done. Um, it, the reason why it intrigues me is it's kind of like the concept of the fugue, which reminded me of your guitar playing. And you know you have Bach, and everyone knows the fugue, and then you have Gerlo, which you know is the incompleteness theorem that you can't study a system from inside the system. And then you have M. C. Escher, who was drawing things that couldn't possibly exist yet apparently they do. And I guess the question I would ask is, because of the way you play guitar, and I've listened to it, do you find any correlation between your mathematical career? And your musical avocation. <laughs> I'm I'm schizophrenic on this one. It's very it's it's very peculiar. I use guitar in my public lectures uh, to illustrate, just particularly to teenagers, to bring mathematics help bring mathematics to life through the formula for the vibration frequency of a stretched string. Uh, which itself has a long history and so forth. Um, uh, so I, in, in, that, in that sense, uh, the, the guitar is absolutely full of mathematics and I make use of it in my lectures and it's uh, been a major part of uh, my move into maths popularization, which I'm, I'm very grateful for in that sense. But when I play for pleasure, I play purely by ear uh, and and mathematics goes out the window. I don't think of it mathematically at all, uh, not, not knowingly. Uh, uh, I, I play, I'm not musically trained. I play simply by, by ear. I want to play some tune. I hear the harmony. I guess the chords through experience and try and get the chords roughly right and then distort the chords to fit in the tune as well. 
and all that is done there's an element of photographic memory about it but it's as i as far as i can see no mathematics at all no i i i, I switch off from mathematics with music and i switch off from mathematics with the music i listen to on record as well which is typically classical symphony rachmaninoff tchaikovsky or something uh, I was certainly not thinking about mathematics if I'm listening to those. Uh, I use that to switch. When I listen to your pieces, the first word that comes to my mind is gentleness. And I wonder if that's something that you feel too. Um, uh, no, and you wouldn't, you, you wouldn't actually say that about the piece which isn't on my YouTube channel, which I is play to teenagers in public on an electric guitar that's which is deliberately uh, more uh, aggressive and in your face and uh, you know it's uh, <laughs> uh, so, uh, yeah so so um no they're not you they're not they're not uniformly gentle though i i i have to admit that that piece was written a few years ago when i was a little bit a little bit younger the, the old the older i get so perhaps like a lot of people the more i um do revert to playing acoustic guitar and rather, and rather, rather quietly and emotionally, rather than <laughs> rather than aggressive, aggressive, aggressive rock. Uh, <laughs> but you, but you can play it. Yes, uh, some of the teenagers would would, would say so. One of one of the, one of these. It was in Newcastle, I think, at the Theatre Royal. I'm with this organisation called Maths Inspiration in the UK, which puts on shows for you know, a thousand teenagers at a time in major city centre theatres. And you know, the, the, it's, it's all a bit absurd, really. I'm, I'm, I'm about three times the age of the other other performers, um, um, but I the, and I do um, explain about the vibration frequency of electric guitar strings. Uh, the electric guitar is sitting, Red Stratocaster is sitting on the stage throughout my little talk. And I, I imagine the uh, audience assumes that I'm going to get some research to play it or something. But eventually at the end, I, I, I pick it up and my suit and play my piece and whatever. And in this, uh, this particular um, uh, occasion, in, I think it was Newcastle. A uh, question time at the end. This voice suddenly comes out of the darkness, saying, uh, "Dr. Ashton, is is your music influenced by uh, Mark Knopfler of Dire Straits?" And uh, and I said, uh, "Yes, it is." <laughs> I thought that was a I thought that was a high moment. You know, I was um, I may not be to play like Mark Knopfler, but um, uh, this this lad obviously thought there was a similarity. So. Um, well, yeah, I mean, the first time I heard Sultans of Swing, I said, this is completely different than any yes. other I've yes. ever heard. And it's yeah, funny yeah. you say Mark Knopfler, because when you think of his technique, that first break, that first, no, the second break, where the instrumental becomes something unique, that does seem mathematical. Darn it, it does seem mathematical to me, the manner in which he does that picking down at the very bottom of the guitar and just... It just takes you away. It yes, um, um, I agree with you that that, that particular record was. Uh, um, I mean, it, it, uh, I mean, one crude uh, remark one could make about it was is is that um, this is simplistic, but uh, one reason it was striking, surely, is because it's in a minor key. Uh, any rock music is most rock rock music is in in major keys, I think. I think to have anything, never mind anything else. The fact that it was in a minor key was was odd. Um, wasn't the only thing, but I think, I think it's a wild guess if something to swing had been in a major key, it would have been nowhere near as um, impactful. It's funny you used a couple of minutes ago. You used the word inspiration, and we're also at the hour point where you and I both oh. agree, you and I both agree that people might be. Uh, that might be enough math, for, but I had two questions. No. What, yeah. One. <laughs> I, I agree. There must be some people who think <laughs> that's enough math for six weeks. But anyway, uh, sorry, <laughs> sorry, sorry, sorry. Well, I, yeah, well, you use the word inspiration, but then there's also the word in your book, imagination, which was oh, another yes. 
Oh, yeah. yeah. And so I'm thinking imagination. So that implies to me that you once again are taking something that's very concrete and then putting it in your head where you take the time to, to repeat the word, imagine what, what could be, imagine what is, but you don't know what it is yet. What is that imagination process that has anything to do with algebra? I, I, I don't sure. I'm not sure I can answer that. But imagine. I'm, I'm so pleased you mentioned that. I, I, I I'd forgotten the concept of imagination. But it's, 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 it's a most crucial thing for making progress with mathematics and enjoying it. And I would say, you first find yourself using it not so much in algebra, but in geometry uh, when you're young. Um, because when you're proving some result, like I think you mentioned earlier, some result about a circle, for example, uh, like <clears throat> 90 degrees at angles in a semicircle or whatever, uh, none of those things do you ever prove by just looking at the diagram uh, and then writing down and therefore it's true and you always have to put in some extra line or triangle or something. You always have to fiddle around and put something extra in that wasn't in the original problem. Uh, and it's, that's the moment, it seems to me, where uh, imagination comes in. In the case of 90 degree angle in a, in a semicircle, you have to draw in a line from the center to the point of um, uh, point in question. Uh, uh, and, uh, without doing that, you don't really get anywhere. Um, and, and so I would say it's through, when you're young, it's through geometry above all else that the imagination uh, really uh, really kicks in. And, uh, but, but mathematics is one of the most imaginative subjects uh, of all. Uh, and that's, that's the first sign you get of it when you're very young in, in geometry. Yeah, and what you say in your video about that when you show the picture of the circle on the line throughout and the, is that you almost say how can this be you do say that you yes say. yes i do I, that was I, I, sorry i don't see, I think i'd be very in you know, articulate about this theorem but this particular theorem which i keep going on about 90 degree 90 degree angle in the semicircle that that theorem was the um, equivalent, if you like, of the 1089 trick at school. 1089 trick I saw in a Christmas annual. If you, are, if you, if you ask me, what's the first really surprising result you saw in mathematics at school, the answer is 90 degree angle in semicircle. Uh, and as I say, to prove it, you need a bit of imagination. I imagine, I can't remember, it was just proved for us. We weren't asked to exercise our imagination, but um, uh, I think it would be a lot to ask. But uh, uh, whoever first did that, well, it was Thales, Greek, ancient Greek, 600, 600 BC, thereabouts. Uh, that was an imaginative moment, drawing in that, drawing in that line that wasn't there in the first place. Yeah, it's a eureka moment. Yes. So. Last question, and this goes to what you were talking about with the reader becoming the owner of the book in essence. So, and again, from my experience as a, a bookseller, so your much more complex work, which is first described in the Wikipedia entry, which then goes to the popular books, which are for lay people like me, even though when someone reads this, they may gloss over the formulas or may not. Um, when you read the understandings of whether it's the spinning top or the Indian rope curve or whatever, what is it that you would like a lay reader to take away from this book after they do close the cover and begin to use their imagination? Or in other words, why do you do this? I think, uh... The short, the short answer, which I probably ought to confine myself to, is I hope they'll take away the idea that maths, serious maths, not what's sometimes called numeracy, uh, which valuable though that is for personal finances and so forth, 
uh, I hope they take away the idea that serious maths can be fun. Uh, but on your on your point about the equations, I I, I could also add um, uh, that in my books, I try to uh, make maths fun, but but at the same time include the equations and indicate how to actually go about doing maths. And in that sense, my books are a little bit unusual. Um, a lot of books are either textbooks, which are full of equations, and I, I do believe passionately myself, that the real battleground in the future is in the gap in between, where you try and do both. You try and inspire the reader and help them do stuff by showing some of the equations and what to do with them. Um, but above all, I would go back to, you know, the short answer to your question was take away the idea that maths uh, not only requires imagination, but can be fun. I love my daughter Annie, and she also really irritates me because I said, I had the book open and I said, okay, here's the river and here's the bathtub and here are the formulas explaining it. And can you help me with this? And she walks in and she looks at the story and then she looks at the equations. She goes, obviously. And then she just walks out. <laughs> <laughs> and that did not help me prepare, but it uh, didn't. No, uh, no, I mean, I, I, <laughs> I, did, I, I did actually, to be honest, I did, I did wonder uh, to what extent that you, you would be uh, dreading this particular interview. And uh, I did wonder to what extent you, you, you might wonder, what on earth did I invite this chap to? This book is full of equations. Why on earth did I invite this person onto my programme? But uh, anyway, it's been a pleasure to, it's been a pleasure to be here. And I, 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 as must be evident, I remain optimistic that uh, if people want to give maths a go, uh, uh, provided someone like me helps show them the real thing rather than some wishy-washy substitute, uh, they can have a good time. Yes, it's uh, should a man's reach exceed his grasp or what's a heaven for? Uh, some, something like that, yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, David. I really enjoyed talking to you. Hopefully I actually did learn something. Now that the interview is over, I will go away. It's my interview now. I can begin to imagine and be inspired by it. So I really do appreciate our time together. Well, thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.